Can you imagine a world without servos? They're used in so many of the products and devices that we own. If you have a PlayStation or an Xbox, there's a servo inside responsible for the extension and the retraction of any discs you put in there. In modern full-size cars, there's a servo that's responsible for controlling the throttle once the sensor senses you've pushed the gas pedal. Now think of the complexity of full-size aircraft or modern robotics. Could they even function without servos? Because servos are used in so many different applications with so many different requirements needed out of them that there are a massive variety of servos used in the world. And in the world of RC, it's no different. So today we're gonna discuss servos. We're gonna look at some of the differences between like the motor types and servos. We're gonna look at some of the different materials used and more. So ultimately, anyone who's looking for new servos has a better understanding of what to shop for when picking out a brand new servo. Uh The most common type of servo that us RC guys are gonna be looking at is called a positional rotation servo. And that basically means it's a servo that it has about a 180 degrees of range or about a, like a half circle almost. And the servo can stop or be set to any position within that range. This type of servo is very precise in its ability to go to any position and it's what we use 99.999% of the time within the RC segment. Just about any time you see a servo inside of a hobby shop and it doesn't say what type of servo it is, it's going to be a positional rotation servo. The second type of servo that you sometimes see in RC is called a continuous rotation servo, and that means this servo can rotate continuously in either direction indefinitely. This type of servo interprets the signals from your transmitter as either a left or a right, or maybe even a speed that it rotates around, but it cannot be set to a particular position, like a positional rotating servo. So about the only time that you would see one of these servos in use is like with an RC crawler winch, where the line would need to be wrapped up on a spool you could put on that servo. Um, or you could flip that servo direction to let out your winch line. There are some other really unique RC applications where you would use a servo of this kind, but it's very specialized. And usually these type of continuous rotation servos are marked on it that that's the type of servo, a servo it is. There's also a third type of servo called a linear servo. It's sometimes used in like RC airplanes as far as I understand. Um, but this type of servo actually uses like a rack and pinion mechanism mechanism inside. So it will, um, in addition to the rotation, I believe it actually just, it kind of moves back and forth, back and forth. It's very uncommon. Although there are some RC applications in the aircraft category where that type of servo might be used. But for our surface applications, nah. Digital servos are the new technology and they aren't that different from analog servos. The main difference is how the servo interprets and processes the signal data coming from your transmitter or the receiver. Now the information on this topic can be a little complex, so if you really wanna dive deeper into this subject, there are some really good resources out there. So I'm gonna keep it short and simple though, but in essence, the response rates from a digital servo are much higher allowing digital servos to not only react faster, but produce more initial torque with smaller adjustment movements from your transmitter, and especially when there are other forces trying to push on that servo to get it to move from its holding position. You'll find that digital servos are more expensive than those analog servos, but they are really recommended whenever um, high speed, high torque, or high precision is required. But for something like a lightweight one-tenth scale backyard basher, an analog servo will work just fine. Servo motors are typically going to be either a cord, a cordless, or a brushless motor. Now your cord motors are often found in entry-level servos, and they offer a brushed motor design that uses a solid, solid iron core armature that's wrapped in wire, and it spins inside a magnet. In a coreless motor, we still have that brushed motor technology, but the armature uses a spinning thin wall mesh 
that actually rotates around the outside of the magnet. So there's no need for that heavy solid iron core. Because of this, coreless motors offer faster response time, higher efficiency, and overall just smoother operation. The downside, coreless motors can heat quickly, uh, especially when you have them running at a full load for a period of time. The third motor type commonly found in really high-end servos is the brushless motor. With the brushless motor, the mechanical parts inside that were used in the brush motor are removed and they're replaced with electronic semiconductor switches, making brushless motors very simple and extremely hard to wear out. If you have a brushless motor in your RC model, uh, you know that that motor will just run pack after pack after pack almost indefinitely. Brushless motors require uh, pretty much no maintenance and they'll last almost forever. Well, brushless motors and servos are no different, offering longer lifespan, increased reliability, and increased torque per watt of power output. The downside to brushless motors inside servos, they're expensive. But as some people say, you get what you pay for. Now, traditionally for years, servos have operated between 4.8 volts and six volts. And this is mainly due to nitro and gasoline powered models needing a receiver battery. And the options for many years were, you can use four AA batteries. That will provide six volts uh, of receiver power. Or you could use a five cell NIM battery pack. And guess what? That provides six volts as well. So you had six volts coming from your receiver battery and you had a servo that operated on six volts and it was just this perfect harmony. It was so beautiful. Well, guess what? Lipos! It's 2020 and we're living in a lipo world now and lipos output more power, more voltage. So to accommodate this, high voltage servos have been developed to operate on a two cell lipo, which is a 7.4 volt nominal voltage or a fully charged lipo is 8.4 volts. A high voltage servo can handle all of that. Now you can use that high voltage servo in a model where the power is only six volts. That's fine, but the power uh, torque and speed specs on that servo will be reduced at that lower voltage. Perhaps the greatest aspect of high voltage servos is that they provide such a wide range of voltage that they'll operate at. So depending on your RC application and how you wanna use that servo and how you're powering it, you have just more flexibility with that servo to achieve your goals. Waterproof servos do exist and they really do work. There are some waterproof servos out there that claimed uh, they can be submerged in water and still operate. Often a waterproof servo in the title of its name will just say waterproof. Sometimes they use the initials uh, WP to indicate waterproof. But if the servo doesn't say either of those terms, do not get it wet and don't assume it's waterproof. It could fail on you if you get it wet. Servo cases are usually offered in either plastic or aluminum, and sometimes it's a mix of both of those materials. And I know what you're thinking, aluminum case is going to be stronger. Yeah, it is, but there are some other real benefits to having an aluminum case servo. First, that aluminum case is going to have aluminum eared mounting points on the side of the case. So it's just more secure when you mount it inside your car and the likelihood of one of those ears breaking off in a collision is very, very unlikely. Once that aluminum case servo is mounted in your model, it's very unlikely it's going anywhere. Second, aluminum works really well at dissipating heat away from a heat source. So an aluminum case servo is gonna help take the heat generated inside and dissipate it out and away. Aluminum case servos also work really well in just high temperature climates, if it's hotter where you are, or if you have a nitro vehicle. There tends to be a lot of heat inside nitro vehicles. Aluminum case servos are really ideal in these applications. Thirdly, and most importantly, any servo that is really, really powerful puts a lot of strain on the internals, the gears, the pins, the outpack, output shaft bearing that's at the top. A really powerful servo is going to wallow out those mounting points inside the plastic case. So a really powerful servo 
needs to have that aluminum case to just hold it all together. Otherwise, the servo isn't gonna last as long. And in the long run, aluminum case servos are just gonna way outlast a plastic servo. Now, the downside to having a full aluminum case servo, it's expensive. It's normal to find the servo gears made from different materials as well, usually to match the strength of the servo, so you're using an appropriate material for the power output. On the low end of servos, you'll find gears that are going to be made out of a plastic or like a, a nylon material. They're great for low stress applications, maybe like that lightweight 110 scale backyard basher we were talking about earlier. Something like that, it would probably be fine. Next would be aluminum gears. These are stronger than plastic. They're also lightweight, but they do cost more to produce or manufacture. Next are titanium gears, which are stronger than aluminum. They're also very lightweight, but they're even more expensive than aluminum. Lastly, steel gears are gonna offer you the utmost in strength inside your servo, stronger than titanium gears, but the downside to steel gears are that they're heavier than all the other materials. And in the... In the vast majority of RC applications, a metal gear servo of some type is recommended. And this is especially important for racers who need the utmost in reliability. The servo torque is the maximum power the servo can provide, and it's usually in the units of ounce inches. Meaning, for example, if we have a servo with 300 ounce inches of torque, then that servo, when using a one inch long servo horn, can move that weight, which if you convert 300 ounces into pounds, it's about 18 and three quarters pounds that servo can move. So for torque, the higher the torque number, the more powerful. For speed, this rating is just telling us how fast the servo can move um, 60 degrees to a specified location. And with speed, lower the time, the better. So for example, if we have a servo that will do 0 0.10, 60 degree a second transit speed, that means the servo can move that 60 degrees uh, in one tenth of a second. Now when picking a servo, usually the recommendation is to get something that's, uh, you get the fastest and the highest amount of torque in a servo that's within your budget. Speed is typically more important for your steering servo for racers, but bashers can also benefit from a fast steering servo. But torque is a big factor for off-road cars where you're using larger, heavier tires, so that's more weight to be moving around, and there are more forces pushing on the tires and pushing against the servo when you're in off-road. If you're landing off of a jump, maybe you land funny, there's hard hit to the tires. If you're driving in sand or loose, loamy conditions, there's a lot of strain on your front steering wheels. Um, so in off-road, Torque is really important. For on-road, where reaction times are just ultra important, speed typically weighs out in the servo selection and torque isn't so much of a factor. Now for some really rough guidelines, rough recommendations for what specs to be looking for for certain applications, we recommend that for one-tenth scale applications, those are kind of smaller and lighter cars, a steering servo that provides 200 ounces of torque is gonna be pretty dang good. It's, it's gonna be more important in off-road than in on-road, but that's a good general guidelines. For one-eighth scale, those cars are larger and heavier. A servo with a torque of around 300 ounce inches is probably where you're gonna to wanna to be looking. And if it's a nitro model, the same recommendation applies for the throttle and brake servo. That throttle servo needs to be really torquey because when you hit the brakes in an eight scale, those mechanical brakes are, are, are holding because the servo is holding. And that's really hard on those throttle servos. So it needs to be fairly robust. And then for the speed recommendation, a 0.10 a second transit speed is kind of a good area to shoot for. It does vary quite a bit, but most high-end transmitters will actually allow you to slow down a servo. So getting a servo that's faster than you need isn't so much of an issue if your transmitter allows you to dial it back. But keep in mind that you cannot make a slow servo faster. 
That was a lot of servo info, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Give this video a like if you liked it. Drop us any questions you have down below in the comment box and be sure to subscribe for our future videos. I'm Brett from A Main Hobbies. Thanks for watching. Auto bug. It's expansive. <laughs>